Uh, we're all here. Um, let's get to our first guest, though, because um, uh, I've been looking forward to this interview as well. You know, for the majority of Iranian expats who have reached academic heights in the West after the 1979 revolution, migration has been a one-way ticket. Even for academics who have stayed clear of Iran's contentious politics, the notion of returning to the old country is daunting for many obvious reasons. But you might say my first guest today was, albeit briefly, the most prominent exception to this rule. In September 2017, Kaveh Madani, a faculty member at Imperial College London and an alumni of Lund University in Sweden and then the University of California, returned to Iran to serve as his country's deputy vice president for the environment. What transpired in 12 perilous months that followed is the stuff of suspense movies. Fortunately for us, he got out and he lives to tell the tale. He was born in Iran and first left for his studies at the age of 22 and went on to become an acclaimed expert on environment and water supply. Last month, Kaveh was selected by the American Geophysical Union to receive the Hydrologic Sciences Early Career Award. Kaveh is a writer, a professor, and now a senior fellow at the Department of Political Science at Yale University. Kaveh Madani from Yale joins me today. Hello, sir. Hi, Gian. Thanks for having me on your show. It's uh, it's nice to talk to you again, and, and I hope you've been keeping safe during COVID. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, so we've, I think we are having a much better condition than many other people on this planet. So I'm thankful. I'm glad you're okay. I, you know, I would be remiss on a program aimed at identity and the Iranian diaspora if I do not get into your harrowing recent episode of becoming a high-level member of the Iranian government and then needing to quit and return to the United States. But let's start with the environment because there, there's a, a lot of conflicting information, it feels like, about the environment in the era of COVID. And there are some that claim that this pandemic is a great thing in terms of amplifying somehow our appreciation for the natural world and uh, curbing urban pollution and destruction. This is due to lockdowns and quarantines. You wrote a piece in Medium in March called Can COVID-19 Create a Turning Point in the Fight Against Climate Change? So what do you think? Is COVID some sort of blessing dressed up as the apocalypse? I don't think it's a blessing, but like any other extreme event and, and crisis, uh, it, it, it can create opportunities. But um, the, the question to ask here is that if, if the changes that we are seeing today are going to be permanent or not, yes, greenhouse gas emissions have dropped, we're using less oil, we are now flying, we are doing a lot of things online, we're not using our cars as often as before in many, many, many countries, even though the price of gasoline has dropped so much. Uh, but, but are these things going to be permanent? I, I'm afraid not unless we take necessary action. So we have to enable the future and do things which are good for the planet. Otherwise, experience shows us that once the economy of nations uh, gets worse, is if if people get unemployed, if 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 um, factories fail, if if businesses go bankrupt, then they have a big crisis, and and they want to avoid that. And when they want to avoid that, then they loosen the environmental restrictions. Right now, we are seeing things happening, you know, with the U.S. EPA and Donald Trump. So we would see the same thing in in some other countries, and countries try to catch up, and 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 then, um, you know, uh, kind of compensate for the period of inactivity, for the period of low production, okay. and, and then take advantage of um, lower oil prices and so on. So we might see a big boost, actually, in, in the environment, our environmental footprint once um, this crisis is over and we again uh, you know, fight for um, make it, putting more money into our pockets. Let me turn it around and, and come at it from a different angle. And, and that is, let me think about how to say this, should we blame the way we treat or we have treated the environment for COVID? In other words, as an environmentalist or an environmental scientist, do you see any correlation between human created environmental calamities or situations and these recent pandemics such as bird flu, such as SARS, and now of course COVID-19? If we wanted like, you know, talk about easy correlations, yes, this virus has jumped into 
our environment has come to uh, jump on humans because we got too close to the animals, right? We started eating them, and, and even in, in, in the last two decades, we have had a number of pandemics, you know, having the same kind of roots, one right. from camels and, you know, then another from bats and, and the same thing. But um, these p- pandemics and viruses and, and diseases have been with us for a long, long time. This is, again, another opportunity for us to think about our diet, to think about what we are doing to the planet. But, you know, it's not as unique as many people say. But would it make us think about what we are doing? Yes. Does it result in a shift in behavior? I'm afraid not on its own without without developing new institutions. I don't think that's going to change our behavior. Once this incident is over, you would have your steak and, and enjoy what you know your food. You would do things as before, and you might even care less about some of the warnings that we environmentalists um, talk about because you remember the point in time in, in, in modern times that all of us were so close to death and we had lost hope. So if you know that another incident like this is likely in your lifetime, you might tell me, shut up, you know, don't tell me about the future of this planet. Uh, you know, I want to enjoy the rest of my life. Who knows what's going to happen to me in, 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 in a few years. And you, all you scientists, did not project something of this magnitude, something this deadly in your worst projections of the future. And you, none of you saw this coming. So how, how can I trust you? You wrote another piece, Kaveh, recently talking about how, uh, related to COVID, and talking about how the world needs to come together to combat this pandemic. And you ended it quite beautifully. In the end of the editorial, you quote the 13th century Persian poet, Sadi, with this passage, human beings are members of a whole, in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. What does that passage mean to you? That's the optimality that I'm after. And as as someone who has dedicated his career to the environment, I have the obligation and the mission of reminding people um, about the the importance of working together and addressing problems together, about reminding people about uh, of our interconnectedness, our um, the interconnectedness of our societies, the fact that uh, water drops or carbon emissions you know don't recognize our political boundaries, the fact that we we have to address the problems together, no matter where in in Iran we are, or no matter where in the world we are, we have problems that we share. Share. So that's my mission. That's that's when it comes to education, outreach, telling people, creating ambitious target, encouraging people to make a move. So so at the same time, thinking about how to materialize or you know put put the words of Sadi into action is something I'm doing as a scientist. And even even in in my political job, I was trying to do uh, things uh, along that line. You know, I don't want to get too far off track, but I remember in a previous conversation you and I had, you, you talked about the um, the racial or the ethnic or the national lines uh, of, of interest around um, environmental concerns, that they're, o- they're not necessarily always universal. Uh, but when I think about something like um, climate change, I mean, isn't that, isn't the whole point of climate change, isn't that global? Isn't the ozone layer over top of Tehran and Toronto and Tbilisi, uh, uh, doesn't that define universal? Sure, it it is, and and you know lots of other things are universal. But if we just single out one problem, and and then expect the nations to trust us and and come fight for that that specific cause, I don't think we we get anywhere. We have to also respect the conditions of different people. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I was in an office in Iran as the deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment, so we have lots of meetings about the problems we have in the country. I'm an environmental scientist. Some of my other colleagues are also like university professors. So they understand the problems. Now it comes to the action time. What do you do about this polluting factory or this petrochemical or this industrial farm, this city and that? Every time you want to make a decision, you're thinking about how many people would get unemployed, how many, you know, how your production would be affected. So then you, you know, then you have a trade-off between unemployment, hunger, then addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And then you think 
that what if I do it and others don't do it? And, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it's about the future impact. And can I make a sacrifice for the future and, and make people unemployed today and have them starve for the sake of the future? And, and then and is this climate justice that we are after? The other thing is, is, you know, people in the developing world always think that, Okay, we didn't create this problem. If you look at the, the cumulative emissions right. of, for example, the United States, UK, and, and some other countries in the West, they're the ones who created climate change, right? It's a global problem, yes, but the ones who created the problem also benefited from it. The, the, their societies are advanced. They're in a better condition. Even when it comes to the point of climate change and its impacts, their societies are more resilient. But now they are telling us to stop selling oil, to, to stop doing this, to, to, to reduce our emissions, to stop our development and, and adopt renewables and so on. So then it's a point where you say, listen, I have so many other problems and so, uh, so many other priorities. How about my food? How about my water? How, how about my jobs? I, I'm not saying that I'm not going to address climate change. I believe in it and I know that my nation is a victim. But if you want my, my help, also like help me. So give me a hand. Pay me, you know, bear the cost, take responsibility for what you have done. And why is that important? Because the problems we have in Iran, the problems we have in India, the problems we have in Afghanistan, China, in, in, in many parts of Africa and South America are very different from the problems That's you have in the U.S. Or, so or oftentimes and, and what, we, the, what we think are the most dire, dire environmental issues are we're socialized to believe that because of where we live in the world or uh, where our concern might lie. Yeah. You know, when is the last time, when is the last time you in Toronto have been concerned about um, air pollution and put a mask on walking outside thinking that, you know, I might get cancer or I, you know, if you're well, well, I, I, I might die. Well, that one, we do talk about air pollution in Toronto, but, I, but I, we don't talk that much about be worrying about where we're going to get our water. And and so that's or, or, that's one or, that I can I can yeah, absolutely water. not even relate air pollution, to. Pollution? Do you do you put masks on in for, no, for air pollution no, in no. Toronto? Do, are you worried about dust storms in Toronto? No. Are you worried no. about you know major deforestation in Toronto? But you know, but even when it comes to, for example, the gas pipe pipeline, you see that the Canadians, modern, developed, in good economic conditions, they're still doing the things that we environmentalists are telling the rest of, you know, the rest of the world, you know, about avoiding, you right. know, avoid fossil fuels. Don't and a lot of people have problems with that in Canada. Uh, there's, a, there's, I mean, yeah. certainly environmentalists do. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it is true, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that when it comes to action, then the policymakers of the modern world also implement things. If the American society, again, um, when it comes to average economic condition, GDP and everything, they're doing much better than the rest of the world. How, how, how concerned are the you know, average in American citizens about the environment? When they vote for, for the next president of the United States, where is climate change? How, how much climate change is, is a driving factor in, in votes? So when you don't see environmental factors playing such a huge role in the West where you live, don't expect the environmental conditions to be the most important, significant factor for those who are li living elsewhere. Well, what would the reaction be in, in uh, I mean, amongst people in the know, uh, let alone uh, the population as well, in India or in Afghanistan, you cited, or, or in Iran, I suppose, um, to, uh, I was going to say Greta Thunberg, but we don't want to, uh, um, I mean, she's a teenager. I, I don't necessarily want to take uh, aim at her, but um, Michael Moore or Al Gore uh, uh, or the, the, the climate change movement, which which declares itself or, or wants to declare itself as an international movement and an international concern. What is the reaction to that in, in places in the world, in other places in the world that might, might have um, different priorities that you've just outlined? Climate change is one of the many byproducts of unsustainable development. Climate change is one product, deforestation, water bankruptcy, desertification, dust storms, air pollution, all of these problems have come with unsustainable development. So it's, it's, it's a mystery for me why we have singled out climate change as the problem and we are pushing for that. So, so if you go around the world, like, you know, I've been to places in Africa, we're talking to the African kids who, who spend 
hours out of school or you know on, on, on their daily life for collecting water so the, for a bucket to get a bucket full and then take it for four kilometers and right. walking for kilometers uh, with that heavy bucket of water shall I talk to that kid about climate change as the major thing right. is it even fair to do that and is it fair to expect the people who are suffering from so many other things to think about climate change as their most important thing? A tremendous eye-opener for me, even even in this moment around COVID, was Nicholas Kristof about a month ago in the New York Times wrote about the, the fact that the prescriptions for how we're supposed to deal with COVID are are sort of top down from the Western world as well, in in the, or or from the the developed world, I suppose. The idea that you have to wash your hands for twenty seconds constantly throughout the day. He pointed out that there's billions of people, billions of people in the world who don't actually have the facilities to wash their hands in their own homes. So the prescription can't even work for those people, even if they were to want to be diligent about it, right? And remember, like, this is not the mistake that would say, like, some ignorant people who have not traveled the world would make. You know, back then, the UN Secretary General even made a video of washing hands and he got blamed for the same thing and that that person you expect him to know this right who to know that there are billions of people who don't have access to tap water and proper sanitation and they don't even have shelters like you know you say stay home stay home like okay i stay at home like which home how many you know this small right. place that we are in this slum do you mean like we don't have so many many uh, rooms to be to separate ourselves from each other and and then the other thing is okay we claim again being ideal and and sitting on in our homes in in north america and not having sympathy for the rest of the world and and ble- thinking that we are blessed that covid-19 is here uh, the other thing we say is it th- th- this virus doesn't discriminate between the poor and and the rich that's a joke environmental problems also discriminate between the poor and the rich uh, why because right now it's proven to us it's proven to us that the amount of money you have has a good correlation a strong correlation with with your resilience if your pocket is full you can stay home longer and this is again and it goes against all of the things we have been talking about. That with the current system that we have, in most places, you don't have the government of Canada to, to give the people $2,000 a month and, right. and ask them to stay home and, and be safe. In many other places, COVID-19 means hunger. It means poorer, you know, worse health conditions. It means worse um, economic conditions. Now we will have this another wave of COVID-19 impacts, which would target the food sector, the food trades around the world. So we will see famine, we will see problems of that kind. And these are not the things that we are worried about. Even in the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak, there were environmental activists who wrote articles blaming the media for overshadowing climate change um, debates and climate change fight by talking too much about COVID-19. COVID-19 is just a virus and it's killing some people, but those people are from somewhere else. I don't want to turn this into, you know, a, a south, north, or west, east I was going to say, in, but info at rookmedia.com person, if you disagree with Kyle, <laughs> because I can imagine there's people listening who, who may be the climate change activists who who, who might, might get their noses out of joint with what you're saying and say, well, no, no, that is the most important issue. What are you going on about? Yeah. Right? The thing is, you know, so if, if they have to go and check my records, I have fought for these things. But when I was in the room, I, you know, I tried to remind, for example, people, the world leaders that, listen, guys, uh, we get too busy negotiating the targets and setting ambitious targets and goals that we forget that we, meet, we need means to get to those points, right. right? So I'm the advocate of the rights and, and, and thoughts and concerns of the developing world in the West. This doesn't mean that we have lack of you know, know-how, technology, lots of other things, and, and, and leaders who, who, who have you know, different priorities, right? So for example, Iran, we, we build a missile, we, we said uh, we, we want to take over this, even the space, but we d- don't build a, a water treatment plant for right. for right. for part of the population, or we don't install 
air filters on on our cars and and then we affect people so that you know we're not here to justify that sort of action or inaction but we to hear, to remind people that things are easy on paper if you want to to have an impact you have to understand the barriers you have to understand how societies think and what their priorities are okay. and then think from their sh- you know put yourself in their shoes and try to come up with a solution okay one more question on um Related to COVID, COVID, and I know I know I can't keep you forever, but I I want there's a lot I want to get to. So let me let me let me just ask you one more around COVID though, and Iran because you obviously get asked about Iran, and in a recent interview with Science Magazine, you described Iran's response to the pandemic to COVID nineteen as, and I'm quoting you, a high stakes battle between science and conspiracy theories. And I read that and I thought my first reaction was hell yeah, Iran always like that. That sounds right. Then I thought, I realized this could also be a way to describe the American response. In other words, isn't that a global description today? I mean, wouldn't you agree that conspiracy theories around the source of the virus are just as viral, if you will, in the West? Absolutely. And I think that must be an uh, eye opener. A lot of things are, are similar. Yes, some, in some places, some of the conspiracy theories are, are driven by ideology or religious beliefs and so on, and that's not different for, you know, so you have Muslim communities doing that, you have Jewish communities doing the same, you have Christian communities, so it's not even about the type of religion. So ideology and religious beliefs can have an impact, but also how educated and informed your societies are. So a lot of arguments that you hear in, for example, Washington and Tehran are the same. So let me give you an example. So one of my, my accusations when the hardliners want to call me a spy or, is that they're blaming me for paying too much attention to the Paris Agreement and, and saying that I wanted to ratify the Paris Agreement uh, to limit Iran's development, to make you know, global commitments, right. international commitments, so they cannot continue developing at the pace that they are developing right now. Who else blamed the Paris Agreement using the same <laughs> right. explanation or reasoning. Washington, D.C., Donald Trump also said that this hoax is, is there to limit development, to create additional costs for the U.S. and so on. And so, on. So, so the argument was exactly the same thing. So on one side, you had a person blonde with a with suit and tie, and on the other side, you have people with, you know, with hairy faces and, and, and wearing some other things, one speaking Persian, the other speaking English. But the, the way of thinking was the same. So the same thing about COVID-19. COVID-19, all the conspiracy theories about COVID-19. Uh, now, if, if COVID-19 had not gone out of Iran, we were still blaming the Iranian government for what they have done. I'm not defending what they have done. They, have, they must have done this, um, and, you know, must have managed it in a much better way. They still have to release data and be transparent about it. We are dealing with people's lives. What they have done is horrible. But remember that in early March, there were like articles blaming Iran for making the, the outbreak global, right. uh, for, for saying how terrible they are. How many of the authors who wrote article, those articles have apologized for their misjudgment or have they said that, oh, we were ignorant. At that point, we, we thought it would be Iran, but I now don't think look any at have. it. Like they they don't people, apologize yeah, for that. So. No. But uh, and there were also articles saying that millions and millions and millions of people in Iran have died and, and Iran's not being honest about that. And I'm assuming that we can now tell that that's not totally true. And you've written about this, the death counts in Iran, et cetera. But at the same time, I, I am I wrong to trust the Canadian stat, stats on death counts more than I do the Iranian stats? No, I think I think we we have good reasons for developing these biases, and um, you know these biases are formed based on you know it's it's based on your level of trust, based on what your governments have done in the past. So so history matters. How you have behaved in the past matters. You cannot like you know uh, change behavior overnight, and and you won't see people trusting you overnight. So automatically we always like look at the, the data that the Iranians release with some level of suspicion and many times this is a good thing because it, it helps us ask questions and so on but sometimes we get you know too much I think out of our way to come up with a story to say something is false or wrong or or they, they did it intentionally or so so my problem with that is once you you say everything is is wrong or they're lying the whole time then the way you fight or the way you 
lead active groups would be different. So the numbers, do we know that the numbers are, are wrong? I think most, most of us agree that the numbers are wrong. Do we know how wrong they are? I don't think we do. So that is the problem. Now, if you don't know how wrong they are, would that justify you coming out and saying that Iran, for example, the number of people who died in Iran by March 10 was 8 million people? I don't think that's a fair game. Because even if you're, you, know, you know that there's a lack of data, still you have to put science as a base of judgment. You have to be honest about what you're doing and your calculations and so on. So you, you have people on both sides who create conspiracy theories. So conspiracy theories, as you correctly said, is not the problem of Iran. It's, it's not the problem of the Iran, the Islamic Republic. Even Iran's enemies have, have come up with their conspiracy right. theories. It is a problem and of when Iran, you have but not, not solely. Right. Coming up with conspiracy theories, the truth is lost. People lose hope, and, and then um, the, the argument and, and fights are, not, are more destructive than constructive. I, I mean, I do want to do an entire um, show episode just based on Iranian, Iranians and conspiracy theories. So I'm not. <laughs> I'm not exonerating us from conspiracy theories, but it just occurred to me that I'm hearing as much as uh, of that in the American media uh, and certain parts of the American media, et cetera, as I uh, uh, as might be emerging from Iran. I have to. So let's get into this. Your your time in the government in Iran. I mean, this was one of the major turning points in your career or maybe your life, your, your decision to return to Iran and joined the Rouhani administration as the deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment in 2017. Uh, this decision, of course, set in motion a cycle of events that uh, eventually led to, led to your early resignation and speedy exit from the country. I, I know you've been asked, Kaveh, a lot about this. Where are you at with the decision you made now? You, you've been called everything from wise to brave to naive to treacherous for taking that step <laughs> to work with and in the Iranian government. If you could transport back to 2017, would you have made the same choice? If I had known that they will arrest me off an arrival at the airport and, and they will put a this ugly label of this spy on me, for sure not. If I have the same level of information and we go back in time and I ask this question from the vice president of the country, who you think you should trust? And you know, that's what I did. Like I said, are you sure I get approved? I don't want to end up in jail. That was my question. And they approved me. They, their intelligence system, security system, apparently had approved me. And then, you know, they appointed, you know, so then the thinking on my, my side was, will I do it or not? Is this a bribe, actually? Because one conspiracy theory of my, was that, you know, they're bribing me. They want me to sh shut up because I'm talking too much, because I'm criticizing the system, and I've written so much about, you know, misgovernance and, and bad management and, and so on. And then, you know, we know that the, how the system is. We know that the chance of success is low. We know that it's, it's very hard to do things, like all the negative things that I'm telling you right now <laughs> in, in this interview. Right. But, but then there's a little chance of making positive impact. And for that, I have to make the sacrifice of moving, you know, living in Tehran instead of London, you know, working for in, in that system, and, and then make compromises. Uh, some of those compromises were impossible to make for me, and I, I stood on, on those lines for, for myself, so I didn't accept whatever they wanted me to do, and that's why I'm here, not in, in Tehran. But there were th things that I could, you know, give up on, and, and I did. And eventually I decided that, you know, this is the first time that the Islamic Republic is making such an uh, offer, so it's an unprecedented thing for the people of my generation, and let's give it a try. Two years has passed, and what we know right now in my generation is that no, it's working with the Iranians. If you don't belong to the inner circle, if you get the same offer that I, as I got, um, is impossible. So that piece of information didn't exist. We, we say that. We, we, we say it's impossible. But now we, have, we know it's even worse. We assume that. But why do you, you, obviously you've thought about this, why do you think the hardliners in Iran ultimately, why did they view you as such a threat? Several reasons, and I still have a you know hard time understanding wh what they're thinking of me. I'm still trying to 
to figure out what's in their mind. And you know, believe me, it's it's a it's it's really hard to do that. And I, I kept telling my interrogators that I'm tired of thinking on your behalf and and putting myself in your shoes and be the game theorist and and think you know think through the the decisions and and come up with something good. But I think us in the West are a threat to those who are running the show, the system, based on all these things that we say, conspiracy theories. Because if, if they tell me that you can, you know, to, to cure your COVID-19, instead of using this drug, you have to use, I don't know, camel urine, then I would react, right? Because I'm a scientist. I can't take it. I, I immediately mm-hmm. react to that thing. If they tell me that, then that was the case, there are clouds are being stolen by the Israelis and that's why we don't get rain. I react. I don't I keep my mouth shut. I, I react. And there's people, you know, a lot of us would do that. So first thing is that you're uh, thinking based on your knowledge and not the ideology of the, the, the system. So you don't comply with that. The other thing is for 40 years, we have said down with the USA, down with the UK and, and you know, lots of things like that. And now we have an American educated person coming home, you know, American educated right. uh, British faculty coming home from Imperial College, by the way, the, the term Imperial right. also right. Uh, created a lot of problems on its own for me. And, you know, coming home and people are celebrating it. So th- there was a huge positive reaction to this appointment. And th- this goes against all the things that we have promoted for, for a long time. So, so a person shaved doesn't look like us, doesn't talk like us, and he's here and he's working. And and what if we have more people like him coming back? The, the system, you know, a lot of these people in the system can't even tolerate Jabot Zarif, who is to them is a Westerner. So compare me and my thoughts with him and and see. But then what why is, would they why would change. they invite you at all? I mean, this is when there's the, the pockets of people who attack you in the diaspora who say you were naive or or they're angry that you did this. It was, it's, it's obvious this would be a PR stunt uh, that they you know, to bring Kavim Adani to Iran. And uh, well, I mean, were, was there anything earnest that you saw in the invitation in the first place? I think a big mistake we make when we interpret Iran's behavior or Tehran behavior is that we think the Islamic Republic is a consolidated unit. So every action is coordinated mm-hmm. and every decision is, is based on years of planning and thought. So the, the fact that, uh, you know, my story got viral and got promoted, uh, was this a planned thing or once the system saw a big, big positive reaction to my appointment, thought this is a good thing, why not they promote it? I, I think it was the latter. And there are people within the system who want to make changes, who want to push the envelope. So so that doesn't mean that the whole system is ready for that. You, you always see like a, a thought, you know, someone making a st- statement which surprises you and someone who has worked for the system. So there are people in the system who, who try to push the envelope. And, and there are people actually who fought for my case. There were pe- a lot of people on the same administration who didn't like me. So it wasn't only, only a fight between me and the IRGC or the government and the IRGC, and, you know, and it was a fight even between me and some people in the same administration who thought it's ridiculous to appoint someone who, you know, we cannot trace back and, and see where he comes from, mm-hmm. how do we know he's, he has not been trained, he's not a spy and so on. So I think this was the case, and I, I saw that you know there are like a few people who are inviting me and thinking this is a positive thing. Now, remember that there were other roles that were proposed, and I didn't say yes to those. You know, I took the one which would minimize my level of conflict with with some uh, other parts of the system. Because if I had ended up in Ministry of Energy or Ministry of Agriculture, I would have been on a continuous fight with those people. I tried to sit in education and outreach and those things thinking that that you know doing something positive increasing the level of information is an apolitical thing so the argument that a lot of people are making is that if you work for that system you're prolonging the life of that system so if you think that way all the doctors who are working for that system are are doing so all 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 the teachers all the like whoever is is doing something positive for the country is prolonging the life of this system right now all the nurses and the healthcare workers who are helping the covid-19 patients in iran are prolonging the life of this system uh, so i don't think it's we can easily say that uh, you know people should not should be given up 
on the roles and everyone must stop working for this system if you want to see a change. I think that environment must be put like what you, you know, said, if climate change is a universal thing, Iran's environment is a national thing. And regardless of the political system, regardless of who is in, in charge, we need to preserve the resources. And if whoever, like, you know, 40 years from now, 10 years from now, two years, one year, few months from now, there is a new administration, there is even a new regime. You want the Iranians to have access to resources, to have water and, and land and, and so on. We should put a lot of these things about politics. And honestly, I mean, this is something that I probably would surprise a lot of people if I say it, but I think in the seven months that I worked for that system, I was much more impactful for Iran's environment that today that I'm working from miles away and, and my level of activity is limited to my social media. Well, I was going to say, is there, was, it, it, I was going to ask, is there a, a scenario? I mean, obviously, there are those that believe that, um, you, you, you know, you can't play footsie with this regime. What were you thinking? But is there a scenario by which things have go, could have gone different for you if if you had more support, I mean, it's interesting. Not long after you, you left in 2018, you did an interview where you said, you know, I blame some of my friends, prominent scientists for staying quiet on issues related to Iran's environment. When there's one entity building a wrong narrative and selling it to the people, it's really hard to counter that if no one's speaking up. Do you wish that more people had been speaking up for you from within? I mean, it's, it's not about me. And I think, for example, in the case of the environmentalists, in jail. They have been in jail for so long and some of their accusations were just funny, nonsense technically. And a lot of apolitical scientists, engineers could have come in front of camera and argue and, and say that these claims don't make sense. When we are sure about a lie that is, is being promoted, we have to react. This, the problem I've seen you know, I, I share this with you. I remember like some days I was coming home really tired and I had a telegram group with, with a bunch of friends in the U.S., U.S. and Canada, all university professors, water professors. And I was sharing some of the social media posts about different, you know, water related topics in Iran. And, and you know, the responses I was getting from my friends, my bodies were like, smileys and funny faces and, you know, cracking up and, and make, you know, having fun with these stories. But those stories, I was sharing th those stories to get their sympathy, not their smiley reaction. Why? Because I was telling them that these things that you think are funny and it's obvious that they're wrong are now becoming part of the narrative here. And who should, be, who should debunk that? Who should fight with that? Mm. If you university professors are silent, so the children of revolution, all the people of my generation who have left Iran, I think they are not really contributing to today's Iran and future, you know, maybe future of Iran, but to, the, to today's Iran. Now, you cannot expect everyone to do that. We talked about rationality early in this, this interview. So you cannot say that everyone must do something for Iran, but we can do things which doesn't take too much effort and they're not political. So a few months ago, one of my um, classmates from UC Davis, who's a professor now, had got a fund to do a study on Lake Rumia. He's American. And he, he approached me and he wanted to run a workshop, some, you know, something like this. And I said, listen, you, you don't know how many, you can't imagine how many workshops we have had on, on Lake Rumia. Instead of doing another thing, just go and create a collection of all the works we have done on Lake Rumia around the world. And he was surprised. In, in a few days, he got back to me and said he had collected more than 300 papers which have been written in the past few years on Lake Rumia uncoordinated. We don't work together. We all are doing things in our, our silos. Right. And then when it comes to Lake Rumia problems, for example, uh, Iran might come up with the story of, yes, the drought caused this or climate change. And then we write things in our papers, but we never get in front of camera to tell the Iranians that this is a big lie. We, we, we don't tweet about it. We don't do this. So my thing is not to blame them for my failure. I think that if more people like me do things and, and travel to Iran and, and, and you know, do 
more work, more outreach work, we can push the envelope. We can change the condition. Uh, that's that's what we have to do. We have to change the boundaries. And there are people in, in, in the system who didn't like the idea of me getting appointed, but after a while they worked with me. And by the way, we have to talk about this because this perception that you cannot work with reg- this regime should be further studied because what do you want to do with that regime? Do you want to change all the things about the environment and make major environmental reforms? You cannot do it even if there is a regime change because these things even in the you know U.S. would be impossible, in the West would be impossible. But if there are, if you're thinking about tiny steps and incremental improvements, I promise that incremental improvements within the system, depending on where you're sitting, is possible. There are things that we, we did. There are okay. you know there are people who I appointed. There are women who I appointed. There are women who I I promoted. There are things that I did, and those things would have been impossible. Uh, without going there, but did I change the world? Did I change Iran? No, you know my impact was small and and very you know tiny. So so, but if we have a lot of us doing things, caring about Iran and doing more on Iran and and try to create and drive an apolitical, scientific, technical picture of Iran, we will have a better understanding of Iran society. We will have a better understanding of Iran's technical problems and, and, and problems okay. in different areas, and we can provide solutions which are practical. Let me ask you a couple of um, brief personal questions about that experience, and then we'll end off just talking about identity a little bit and how you, how you self-identify. First of all, in, still sticking with this experience of 2017, 2018, and, and being in the government in Iran, and then um, uh, your speedy exit, as I called it earlier, you said in some ways your time in Tehran was the best sabbatical. Let me quote you. Uh, my time in Tehran was the best sabbatical one academic could wish for. There, this was a, a wonderful learning experience. On the other hand, I realized that I'm lucky I'm not in prison or dead. So, Kavan, let's take the first half of that. What what did you most learn from this experience on a personal level? So, they, they called me a spy, and I was a spy. I was a spy for the Iranian people, Iranian Iranians living abroad on the government. I was one of those who got you know very close to the, you know and went inside the system and and saw how things are being run. I, I saw that there are a lot of good people. Who work at different levels, and and regardless of the system, you know who's running the system, they want to have a positive impact. They care about Iran. I saw a lot of people who didn't like actually um, the ideology of the system, but are were sitting in those positions and they're putting a lot of effort into doing positive things. So it surprised me how how quickly we got we could get together and and build some trust and get things done, and that's a very positive thing. So so a lot of things that I'm talking about or a lot of things that I talked about and got awards for um, got verified actually in, in my experience. So it was the best sabbatical in that sense, but it was a super risky sabbatical because I w- could have been in jail right now or you know you know who knows what what else could have happened to me and and I would have been just a hashtag on social media. And That's how, it. And how, like so and many how, other and how scared were you in the end? By the time you left, when the walls came crumbling down in terms of the support you had within the government, how? It, it, it was from day one. I mean, I, I arrived in Tehran and I got arrest. It wasn't like, you know, being scared is something. So, so at the time that I, I signed off on, on this and I said I would go to Iran, I, I had a fear of going through these issues. But uh, there were like moments that I, I thought that we won't win against these people because because they're so powerful or ignorant you know because they're ignorant they're powerful and and they carry guns and and they have power and and they come after you so and they don't listen right a lot of my interrogation sessions were education sessions where you you know that you're facing someone who doesn't understand how the world is run and they don't know what things are happening in this part of the world and and they they're accusing you but they're you know some of them are listening to you and and which what you tell them would educate them but some of them come with this lens of just like they're pessimistic and whatever you say they they don't believe you because they think you're a spy so as a spy you have been trained to lie you have been trained to distract and so on and i I was fighting that i was i was trying to educate i was trying to say okay you know let me tell you this when they arrested me up in arrival they took control of 
all my emails, everything, right? Now, the IRGC has 13 years of my records, every detail of my life. This is, you know, privacy violation. I was hurt. I didn't like this and so on. But I said, I haven't done anything, anything against national security, anything about against uh, my nation. So I, I'm not afraid of anything. They can go through this. And my, my thing, you know, now thinking of being naive is that you go through my emails and you go through my life and you realize that I'm not connected, I'm not a spy. Whereas they're still trying to find something, with, you know, in my emails and say, you talk to this guy who is from Israel or grew up in Israel and, and then you're a spy. So you're dealing with ignorant people. This is my problem. This is what I found in Iran, that the level of ignorance is high. Yes, Iran is very educated. We have you know, got, given degrees to people. We, have, we are publishing a lot of papers you know, in peer-reviewed journals or university students are doing great and they're coming to the best universities in North America, but the level of information is low. And, it's not only Iran, you know, U.S. is the same thing. That's why you get Donald Trump and U.K., you get Brexit. So we have these trends everywhere. But, but in Iran, the cost of this is huge. So lots of opportunities are being um, killed by a system which, which doesn't know that it doesn't know, by people who don't know that they don't know. This is the problem. And they need education. They need awareness. And I'm not saying it's an easy thing, but we also need fighters who would spend time on public education, raising awareness, writing things which are about today's Iran, contemporary Iran, explaining the problems, uh, how's the state of economy, how's the state of environment, how's the state of agriculture, um, provide solutions, don't, don't put a negative lens on it and, you know, put a try to come up with to to come up with the stories that you like look at the okay. data and what you can extract and and use the language of science i'm not saying we shouldn't have political forces and fighters i'm not saying we shouldn't have people on on both sides it's good all of those can be constructive but i think there's also a need for the children of revolution who understand that system and have been in the west so the identity issue that we probably can speak about related to that so these people can raise awareness can make a connection between the two words and, and can help with understanding the real Iran and help the Iranian public understand the real world. It's easy to sit down and blame and blame and blame, but if we only blame, if we only blame, then the public would lose hope. The people who would lose hope would do worse. And if, if you're talking about the environment, maintaining the, the level of hope uh, and, and, and keeping your society positive besides, you know, getting them scared of the bad, bad future is the key to, to making, to promote changes. Okay, so all of what you've just said, almost all of what you just said leads perfectly to segue into asking you about identity um, as we finish. I'm, I'm very grateful for the amount of time you're, you're giving us. Hey, you, Kava, you've done a lot of interviews about having to leave Iran after you went there with the hopes of wanting to create change around environmental policy. You know, for the purposes of this interview, I did want to go deeper into how you self-identify and why why you would leave a seemingly safe and prosperous academic life in the West to enter that political mix in Iran. You, you know, you're an Iranian kid who, who left in your early 20s. You studied in Sweden. You, you then did a PhD postdoc in California. You've worked as an academic in Europe, then at Yale. You spent almost half your life in the West this may seem like a strange question, but what leads you to feel as Iranian as you do? Of course, as someone who grew up in Iran, I have some biases toward my country, and I, I might care more about some of the problems that we have in Iran, and I, I, I think I, I know the language and I, I can explain things to people. So on, on a given day, if I can make a tweet about the problem in, in Kenya and, and Iran or the U.S. and Iran, I might choose to talk about Iran. But, you know, if you're asking me if, if I feel Iranian or, or American or, or British, I, I think I'm, I'm Iranian. And I, maybe I, I live too short in different places to, to uh, I move from Tehran to Tabriz, Tabriz to Lund, Sweden, and then a short period of time, Waterloo, Canada, then California, then Florida, and then London. So I, I was just moving a lot, and that might be an indication of 
confusion, not not being happy with what I'm achieving and wanted more or wanting to be closer to Iran. But, you know, I grew up there. I understand the problem there. And I, I think there are things that I can do which which are bene- beneficial to Iran, beneficial to the developing world. And that part of the world needs more more help. And there are tons of other people who can do the uh, the things I I do or say the things I I say or write the papers I write in this part of the world uh, on on issues in in this part of the world. But when it comes to stuff on the, that part of the world, I think there's there's so there's a big gap, and uh, people like me can help. So I, I thought I would enjoy doing things for my country, and I I tried it, and I'm paying a huge cost for it. Every day I wake up, and there are you know there are smear campaigns, attacks. Still, I'm getting attack on my social media. Any post I uh, put on social media, there is something underneath uh, from people in, inside the country who think I'm a spy, from people on this side of the planet who think I was a traitor and I shouldn't have gone to Iran to help that system, and I had plans to, you know, make money and 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 uh, live close to power. So I'm paying that that cost, but I I think. I I'm still enjoying doing things for Iran. Um, that might be just an emotional thing. I'm I'm enjoying doing things for the environment. It, isn't that an interesting paradox? What you just said, because you, with uh, with you, you you went back to Iran and took that high profile profile government job, and you were considered too Western by some. You've said it in this interview, but you know they just saw you as some Western guy coming in trying to move in on the action and and thus untrustworthy, if not a spy. And yet Mm -hmm. you've had circumstances here in the West where you are the Middle Eastern guy on a panel or even seen as an agent of the regime in Iran. So how do you process that paradox that is your your life? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have the solution for that, and I still know how I, now, I have to navigate through. But I know myself, and I know why I made that decision to go to Iran, and I know why I decided to, to exit what the circumstances were and, and what drove my, my decision and what I accomplished in Iran, what I learned in Iran. So uh, the only thing is that I trust myself and I continue to fight for what I think is right. I might be wrong. I might be totally wrong. That's what we learn in science, that uh, we can be, our judgments can be uh, totally wrong, but that, that's something I have to live with. Um, yes, when it comes to, um, when I talk about some of the problems in Iran, for example, people think that I'm justifying the bad actions of the government. Uh, if I'm saying that, yeah, you know, the decision to do do this was right, I'm defending the dictator or, or I'm defending a certain group within the system. That mentality is there. I still get stopped at borders. I'm being questioned for the seven months I spent in Iran, even though at that, <laughs> carrying an Iranian passport, I get stopped at every border, even though in Iran, in every interrogation, I had to, I, I had to prove to them that I am not a dual national. I don't have a second passport. So it's it's a paradox. It's a it's a big cost that I'm paying. But I think anyone who gets into speaking science and speaking about facts and trying to come up with the right narrative would get that. Because, well, that's interesting. Because that's interesting to I, me. But what's interesting right? about this is you're an environmental scientist. You're an environmentalist. I, I, I probably have some outdated notion of like environmentalism as benign somehow, but it, it doesn't, it hasn't always seemed like something that would be dangerous. But uh, uh, given what happened to some of your colleagues in Iran in 2018, uh, it has been. And as someone who's fought on the front lines of the environment in different continents, do you think being an environmentalist in this day and age is inevitably a political struggle? I think environment has the power to unite. For a long, long time, environment was a safe space. Maybe even the the government, the system, let people uh, talk about environmental problems, like Rumia, air pollution, this and that. So, So they don't talk about other matters. But now we are at a stage that environment can unite forces. Um, whether you are in opposition, whether you are a reformist or a, a, a hardliner, you know, left, right in Iran, you care about Lake Rumia. You care about air pollution. You care about this. If, whether you are Shia, Sunni, where you come from, you care about these things. And and so environment has has a, has a strong 
potential for uniting people against systems. And once you're out and, and um, asking for for your right to have access to clean drinking water, the, the recent incident that we have seen in Iran the last few days that everyone is now talking about in Khuzestan, then you know no one can stop you. People have a hard time saying that you did the right thing for, for you know coming out and asking for your water right. So so then we we get to a stage that the environmental space can get abused by people on both sides. So a system which doesn't trust people always questions you. Why, the, why do these people spend so much time, hours actually, in the field trying to save cheetahs? Why, why are cheetahs so important? We are seeing people dying. Who cares about cheetahs? 50 cheetahs. We don't want them. So, so you can't explain why you mm. do it because there is no income, there is no money, there is no return. For a system who has got, you know, used to doing things for money, doing things for profit, understanding why environmentalists are doing these things is, is nonsense. So the environmental space is getting abused. And this is not about Iran. This is not about, this is again another mistake that we make. And we think it's, it's only Iran which has got paranoid about the environment. I'll give you an, another example. I had a, an Egyptian diplomat as a PhD student. In, at Imperial College, we were working on the Nile. Two years in, into his PhD, the Egyptian intelligence realized I'm not a UK national. They thought that I was an Iranian British. And, and once they realized I was Iranian, because they invited me to go to Egypt and I said, I can't come, I can't get a visa, they realized I was Iranian. They got paranoid. They didn't, because they didn't want an Iranian to have access to Nile data. Now, again, like, what we, you know, we make fun of the Iranian intelligence, uh, thinking that they, they don't know what's happening. They think we will like, you know, we don't have access to the data right. that they're talking about because the satellites are everywhere. We can't collect the data from the satellites. Uh, but they don't have the intelligence units, don't have the, the right, I, I think, training and education. So, so they got paranoid. And we had to take action on that. And, and we, I even had to, you know, let this student go to my colleague because, you know, they, they couldn't stand my name on his dissertation and they were so paranoid and the student was under pressure. So that's Egypt. Um, in Israel, we have the same thing. In Iraq, we have the same thing. And, and so a lot of countries, we, we are seeing that increasingly this, the environmental space is becoming problematic. The number of people who have got killed around the world, the number of environmental fighters has been huge, especially in, in the developing world. So this space is increasingly getting securitized and politicized, unfortunately. When, when Netanyahu or Donald Trump or Pompeo talks about Iran's water problems, the normal reaction of the system is to say that, okay, now from now on, whoever talks about environmental problems in Iran is, is in alliance with, right. with Donald Trump and Netanyahu, so you're a spy. So sometimes it's, you know, people who get caught in, in, uh, in the middle of this politics. And I think the, you know, the, the innocent people uh, who are in jail, the environmental group, is, is, is no exception. We, you know, one Iranian Canadian died, you know, now we still, it's a mystery mystery for like you know what happened they just come and tell us he committed suicide that's it and and then eight more people you know so one of them now released but eight other people have been in jail and 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 you know who knows they can go get back to field and help and and, and so on and these are the people who who thought they can the environment is apolitical doing something for cheetahs would not hurt the their system it would be good for 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 the for the nation for for everyone for wh whoever is in in power but it didn't work that way so that is that is really really frustrating now the way to fight that we have two options either shut our mouths up and and say okay they they don't let us do anything this system doesn't let us do anything or or to ch talk about the truth and and speak the truth and and fight back okay. and 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 challenge their 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 stories and their narratives their false narratives and i think a lot of people a lot of us can do that without even even getting into politics if we care about the that, future that well. may be another perfect segue a final question to you kave listening to you and listening to what you've done in the last few years what motivates you to be so prolific in your work these days? I mean, you're not just focused on water supply and climate and food, but the environmental movement on death counts in Iran, on game theory, on writing countless articles, being involved in debates. Why be involved in so much of the public discourse? I know I probably sound like your mother at this point, but, but why put yourself out there so much? 
you know, you talked about the attacks in social media. Why put yourself out there so much after after all you've been through? What's driving you now? I, I understand and, and feel that the, the things I do are also rewarding and, and have some impact because on a daily basis, besides the attacks that I get, I also get a lot of likes or a lot of messages of people who, who appreciate what I, I'm doing. I, I get notes from teachers who, who, who thank me and, and say that the videos I, I put online were like shown in, in, in their classes and the students like them. They ask me for solutions. They ask me for material to share with the student. I still have a lot of colleagues of mine who contact me, ask me questions like, you know, on what to do and, you know, they check with me if their idea is, is good or not, you know, when it comes to education, when it comes to solving one problem um, somewhere. So, so I think that what I enjoy d doing is, is, is helping with problem solving. That's the nature of, of the person who, who is in academia. And I, I picked the area I've picked is complex systems, complex human nature systems. So, and, and it was originally water, but then I got into energy, I got to environment, food, and now I'm doing even health-related work. And I, with the experience of being in, doing policy-related work, I try to combine these things and, and talk about problems and, and help with with public education, um, with with raising awareness. Not that I I know better, um, but but I think you know even even I try to bring people to the table. Started a recently, a, you know, the contemporary Iran forum show at Yale and and asking people who don't automatically go in front of camera or or avoid going to um, the opposition media channel. To, to come in front of camera and explain things, just share the things that they know and they think uh, should be common knowledge because a lot of people don't know those things. And so that's, that's uh, the thing I continue to do. And even if I didn't want to do those things, I think now more than before I feel obligated to those things because if I stop doing things for Iran, I might confirm the story that I was a spy and I, I did all these things for, for a reason and for, for get it, you know, for, for what they were telling me for infiltration and going there and, and changing um, everything. But I, I want even the same people to understand the realities and complexities of water management, why we have to reform our, our water management system, why there are things to be done, and there are so many things that can be done, and why getting people act and make them hopeful would be good for the environment despite all the problems we have. So I think that's the motive and I, 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 I'm hoping that I'm helping Iran by doing these things. It's invigorating, interesting, educational talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Kave. Thanks for the opportunity, Gian. Bye-bye. Bye. That's Kave Madani, writer, professor, senior fellow at the Department of Political Science at Yale University.